should be fine. So, hi all. Uh, welcome to this week's talk as part of the theory seminar series. We are glad to have with us Dr. Kartikin Chalasikar, who is going to be talking about approximate representation of symmetric submodular functions via autograph functions. Uh, he completed his PhD from Georgia Tech. Further, he was uh, at the Simons Institute for his postdoctoral studies. Since then, he has uh, been a faculty at the uh, University of Philippine, and his research interests broadly span integer programming, operatorial optimization, and troubleshooting. Uh, that thank, thank you for having me, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, before I start the talk, I want to briefly uh, advertise uh, PhD at the University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Uh, uh, it's a nice place, typically in the summer, spring, and fall. Uh, the winter is a little hot, but if you're into snow and such things, it's, it's good. Uh, uh, if you're here, then I'm assuming that your interests are typically in uh, theory algorithms and optimization. Uh, Urbana Champagne is pretty big in these areas. We, we have a uh, lot of people. Uh, we, we have people on computer science. We have people in industrial engineering. And we have uh, many other faculty in uh, related areas. Uh, the graph theory combinatorics group is pretty strong. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and students typically tend to take courses across uh, departments in, in different areas. And uh, it's also a pretty vibrant group. We, we have uh, several seminars uh, running through the through the week, every week. Uh, and here, here is a quick summary of courses that I managed to pull out. These are the typical courses that students take. Uh, as you can see, the they students take uh, courses in different departments. Uh, and this, this is, uh, these are special topics courses, which are sometimes offered regularly and sometimes not so regularly, but uh, yeah, it, it just keeps evolving. Uh, right, that, that's all I want to say. If you're interested in applying, uh, please do come talk to me. I'm happy to chat. Uh, I'm here uh, through this week. I'll be in 201, so I'm happy to chat. Uh, all right, uh, let's get to the talk. Uh, I'll talk about approximate representation of uh, symmetric submodular functions via hypergraph cut functions. Uh, this is based on joint work with uh, my advisee, Karen Weidemann, and Chandra Chekuri and Charles Shu. Right, let me begin by introducing uh, symmetric submodular functions. Uh, what are symmetric submodular functions? Uh, a set function defined over a finite set B. Uh, is said to be symmetric if for every subset A, the function value on A is equal to the function value on the complement of A. It is submodular if uh, for every pair of subsets A and B, the sum of the function values on A and B is at least the sum of the function values on the intersection and the union of A and B. And submodularity is also equivalently expressed by the diminishing marginal returns property which says that for every pair of subsets P and Q, where P is contained in Q, and for every element U, the marginal increase in function value when you add the element U to Q is at most the marginal increase in function value when you add the element U to P. This is called the diminishing marginal returns property. Uh, some well-known examples of submodular functions include uh, matroid rank functions, coverage functions, hypergraph cut functions, uh, matroid rank functions and coverage functions are not symmetric, but hypergraph cut functions are symmetric. And I'll formally define hypergraph cut functions later, and also matroid rank functions later. Right. Uh, so modular functions arise in uh, several concepts in uh, combinatorial optimization. And uh, owing to the diminishing marginal returns property, uh, it is also used to model, model valuation functions of agents in game theory. So it also arises in game theory economics. Right, so it's, it's fairly prevalent uh, in combinatorial optimization. Uh, throughout this talk, we will only be interested in uh, functions which take non-negative values. Uh, and moreover, the function value on the empty set will be assumed to be zero. So I'm going to make this assumption throughout. And uh, for the for purpose of simplicity, I will also assume that the max function value is polynomially bounded. 
Uh, here, n is the size of the ground set. It's the size of the set B. And I'm going to assume that the max function value is polynomially bounded. Just because we are interested in representation, I don't want these function values to be too huge. Right, so we will be interested in uh, representing submodular functions uh, by a representation. Uh, what I mean is, a, is a, it's, it's a way to write out the function so that we can recover the function value of every subset. So that's what I mean by a representation. Uh, note that the representation, representation size of an arbitrary set function is typically exponential. Even so not only non-negative uh, valued functions, even zero one valued functions to represent such set functions, you need exponential size. But submodularity brings a lot more structure. So a natural question is uh, whether submodular functions admit concise representation. By concise, uh, I want the size of the representation to be uh, polynomial in the size of the ground set or even two to the little o of n. Can I get slightly better than two to the n? Right. And let me right away distinguish this structural question from the algorithmic question. In the algorithmic question, we are given a submodular function. The submodular function, how are we given this? We are given this via an evaluation oracle. So if you get to query the function value on a subset, the oracle will tell you the function value on that subset. We're given a submodular function through this oracle, and uh, we would like to construct a concise representation of the function using polynomial number of function evaluation queries. Right. Uh, let me emphasize the difference between the structural question and the algorithmic question. The structural question asks whether there exists a concise representation. The algorithmic question asks whether a concise representation can be constructed using polynomial number of function evaluation queries. In the algorithmic question, we are not interested in runtime, but we are interested in the number of function evaluation queries. So the, the structural question is an existential question. Algorithmic question asks us to construct such, such a representation using polynomial number of function evaluation queries to the order. Right. Uh, the algorithmic question is of uh, particular interest in learning, sketching, streaming, and testing. Here you want concise representations. Uh, so the algorithmic question has been studied uh, in these contexts for specific families of submodular functions. Not for all submodular functions, but for specific families of submodular functions. For example, uh, here is a simple result that answers the algorithmic question for graph cut functions says that uh, if we are guaranteed that the input submodular function here is in fact a graph cut function, then there exists an algorithm to construct an order n squared size representation using order n squared function evaluation queries. Note that the representation size is polynomial in the size of the ground set and the number of function evaluation queries is also polynomial in the size of the ground set. So if we are guaranteed that the submodular function is in fact a graph cut function, then there is a concise representation. And it can be, so existence of concise representation should be clear because it's a graph cut function, you just construct the graph. But you can also construct this using polynomial number of function evaluation queries. Uh, this, this is a simple exercise. You're welcome to think about it and I'm happy to talk about this later. Right, so again, the, the difference between structural and, and algorithmic questions should is, is important. If there are any questions, now is a good time to raise this. Uh, and if, if the answer to the structural question is in fact no, then it doesn't make sense to study the algorithmic question. The algorithmic question is interesting only if you can say yes for the structural question. And this is why the algorithmic question has been studied only for specific families of submodular functions. For example, for graph cut function, the answer to the structural question is in fact yes. And that's why you go into the algorithmic question. And uh, for, for this talk, we will primarily be interested in the structural question in this for general submodular functions. And uh, let me right off the bat show you that the answer to the structural question is in fact no. 
uh, in, in particular, symmetric submodular functions, not only submodular functions, even symmetric submodular functions do not admit concise representations. Right. Let, let me sketch a proof of this. The proof of this uh, was the, sort of the starting point for later results. So let me sketch a proof for why symmetric submodular functions do not admit concise representations. That is, there is no two to the lid low of n sized representation for symmetric submodular functions. Uh, to, to show this, uh, we will show that there exists two to the two to the omega n distinct symmetric submodular functions. So if you have so many distinct symmetric submodular functions, then if, if, if there exists a two to the lid low of n sized bit representation of each one of these functions, then the number of representations is only two to the two to the little of n, but the number of distinct symmetric submodular functions is two to the two to the omega of n, and that would be a contradiction. So it's sufficient to argue that uh, there exists this very large family of distinct symmetric submodular functions. And uh, here's one way to show this. Uh, look at this family F, which consists of uh, symmetric functions that map subsets of size n over two to zero one. These are not set functions. They only map uh, subsets of size n over 2 to 0, 1. Uh, but they're symmetric. Now, for each of these functions, we define another function gf as shown here. The precise definition is not important, uh, but observe that this function g is, in fact, symmetric. Okay. This is a set function. It is defined over all subsets. For every subset s, this is how it's defined. It's symmetric here, this is symmetric, and if the size is n over two, then this is also symmetric because f itself is symmetric. Right, so th this function gf is symmetric, and with little more work, one can show that this function is also submodular, so this, this is in fact submodular. So for each f in this family, we define this gf, it turns out to be symmetric submodular. Uh, now look at this, uh, this family G, which consists of the GF for each function F in, in this family. Uh, it consists of distinct symmetric submodular functions. They are distinct because F is distinct. And how many such functions do we have? It's exactly the number of functions in this family and the number of functions in this family. But the number of ways to choose uh, N over two elements from N is N choose N over two. And for each of these, you get to ascend zero over one. So it should be two raised to N choose N over two. But I'm dividing this by two because these functions are symmetric. So overall, this turns out to be two to the two to the omega N. So you get this large family of uh, distinct symmetric submodular functions. Right, so even symmetric submodular functions do not admit uh, concise representations, although there is a lot of structure to symmetric submodular functions. Uh, now, instead of asking for uh, concise representations, which will help us recover function values exactly, we could ask for concise representations, which will help us recover function values approximately. So what if we settle for uh, asking for concise representations, which will help us recover the function values approximately? So let's let's formalize this question. What is approximate representation of uh, symmetric submodular functions? Uh, we will say that a function f is alpha approximated by function g if for every subset A, the function value on A, f of A, is within an alpha factor of G of A. So f of A is at least G of A, and it is at most alpha times G of A. Right. Now, with this definition of approximation, no, note that we, we are asking for approximation on every subset. Right. Now, with this definition, here is the reformulation of the structural question. Uh, does every symmetric submodular function admit an alpha approximate concisely representable function? Question. You don't need G to be submodular. Uh, yeah, I'm not asking for G to be submodular. So, yeah. Right. So does every symmetric submodular function admit an alpha approximate concisely representable function? Equivalently, this is asking for every symmetric submodular function F, is there another function g over the same ground set 
such that f is alpha approximated by g and g is concisely representable. And there is the similar algorithmic question for a given symmetrics of modular function f, can we construct a concisely representable function that alpha approximates this f using polynomial number of function evaluation queries? And once again, the, this algorithmic question is of interest in learning, sketching, streaming, and testing. So th this has been studied for specific families of submodular functions, in particular monotone functions, coverage functions, and so on. Right. For our purposes, we, we will be interested in the structural question. Uh, and we are not the first ones to ask this uh, structural question. Uh, this has been uh, studied in the literature before. Uh, Balkan, Harvey, and Rivata, they showed that for every symmetric submodular function f, there exists another function g on the same ground set, such that f is root n approximated by g. And moreover, this function g is of, is of this form. For a subset s, the function value g of s is the square root of chi of s transpose m times chi of s. Here, chi of s is the indicator vector of the subset s. And M is a symmetric positive definite matrix. Note that this function G has a concise representation, represented by this matrix M, which has N squared entries. Uh, so this function G, in fact, has a concise representation. So for every symmetric submodular function, there exists a root N approximate concisely representable function. So that's what this result says. Uh, here, note that this function g is uh, is not symmetric, possibly asymmetric. Okay, uh, so the natural next question is whether we can improve the approximation factor using other concisely representable functions. The so square root of the quadratic form is one possible function family. What if we want other, uh, what if we look at other concisely representable function? In particular, what if we look at uh, hypergraph cut functions? These are symmetric submodular. So what if we uh, try to represent symmetric submodular functions using this subfamily of symmetric submodular functions? So that, that question, yes. N is throughout the size of the ground set, it's the size of B. Any other questions? Is M computable or is it? Uh, I believe this is computable. I, yeah, they, they write it as an existential result, but this is in fact computable using polynomial number of functions. Okay. Have they shown that this is the best that you can do? So, uh, they did not show a lower bound. Uh, yeah, I, I don't recall seeing a lower bound, but this comes from John Selipsoid and so on. So it's unlikely that we can improve this using using square root of quadratic forms. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if they've shown a lower bound. Right, so we, we came at it from, uh, from, from from the perspective of hypergraph cut functions, because these functions are not symmetric and uh, they are not even subclasses of what we are trying to represent. We are trying to represent symmetric submodular functions, but we are going outside symmetric submodular functions, whereas hypergraph cut functions are also symmetric submodular. So we, that's the perspective that we come from. Okay, let, let me define hypergraph cut functions. What are hypergraph cut functions? Uh, let's first define hypergraphs. A hypergraph is specified by the vertex set along with a collection of hyperedges and with uh, weights on hyperedges. Throughout, we will assume that these uh, hyperedge weights are non negative. Uh, what is a hyperedge? A hyperedge is simply a subset of vertices. For example, here is a set of vertices, and here are possible hyperedges over this vertex set. Every hyperedge is a subset of vertices. <coughs> now, 
for a subset A of vertices, we define the set delta of A to be the set of hyperedges which intersect both A and the complement of A. These are the hyperedges which uh, cross the subset A. Now, now with this definition, we, we define this cut function of the hypergraph specified by vertex set V, hyperedge set E, and hyperedge weights W. I'll denote this by D, V, E, W. Uh, this, this is defined over the vertex set. The vertex set is the ground set. Uh, the cut function value of a subset A of vertices is the sum of the weight of hyperedges crossing this subset A. Now, it, it should be immediately clear that this function is symmetric because uh, if a hyperedge crosses A, then it also crosses the complement of A. So this function, the cut function of a hypergraph is in fact symmetric. And uh, with a little more work, one can show that the cut function is in fact uh, submodular as well. Cut function of a hypergraph is symmetric submodular. And we will say that a uh, function G is uh, defined over a ground set P is a hypergraph cut function. If there exists a weighted hypergraph with vertex set V whose cut function is exactly this. Questions on this definition? Now, if every hyperedge is of size two, then the hypergraph is in fact a graph. And we will say that a function G is a graph cut function if there exists a weighted graph with vertex set V whose cut function is exactly this G. Graph cut functions are special cases of hypergraph cut functions. Right. Uh, I mentioned that we are interested in concisely representable function families. Uh, graph cut functions are concisely representable. What about hypergraph cut functions? Are these concisely representable? This, this is a natural question. Uh, in particular, uh, note that the number of hyperedges in a hypergraph could be exponential. Because a hyperedge is a subset of vertices, you could have potentially all exponential uh, hyperedges in the hypergraph, in which case it's not a concise, the hypergraph is not a concise representation. Uh, but if you're willing to tolerate a two factor loss, then there is a concisely representable hypergraph. This is due to the existence of hypergraph cut specifiers. Hypergraph, so maybe don't read this for now. What do hypergraph cut specifiers state? Uh, hypergraph cut specifier result says that. For every hypergraph with hyperedge weights, there exists another hypergraph on the same vertex set where the number of hyperedges is only order n log n. And the cut function of the new hypergraph uh, two approximates the cut function of the original hypergraph. So you can take a hypergraph which potentially could have exponentially many hyperedges and still obtain a new hypergraph which has only order n log n hyperedges such that the cut function of the new hypergraph approximates the cut function of the original hypergraph. But of course, you, you, you will use fewer hyperedges, but you will also use different weights. Question. Uh, you can construct hypergraph cut specifiers. If, if you're given a hypergraph, you can construct a specifier fairly efficiently, almost linear time. This is a new series of results. Another question. The number of edges is bounded for uh, is, let's say some polynomial from four times the HDL group. Exactly. Or, or is the number of. Uh, no, I, I don't know. The question is if the number of hyperedges in the given hypergraph is, let's say, n to the four or n to the six, then um, can you construct another hypergraph? Who, which has uh, order n log n hyperedges with, with different weights, such that the oh, new hypergraph cut function is exactly equal to the original. And not, not n log n, I'm just saying that you do. Do what? Uh, concise representation. Concise representation. Oh, you don't care about constructing another hypergraph, you just want a concise. Yes. I don't know. Just like in the graph data. 
Yeah, yeah it's all, if, if it is already n cube, then it's already concisely representable, or n to the six. Right. So cut specifier is another way to state it in, in the context in, in these uh, definitions that I've been using is, is equivalent to saying that for every cut function, hypergraph cut function, there exists another hypergraph cut function on the same vertex set such that uh, the given cut function is too approximated by the new function and the number of hyperedges corresponding to the new cut function is only n log n. So okay. how much time does it take to construct this specifier? Yeah, so this, this is... Uh, there is a recent research showing that you can do it in almost linear time. Linear number of hyperages? Number of hyperages. This, this has been improved in the last three, four years. So it started very recently. Um, and then, yeah, the, yeah, it's almost linear now. But you have to throw in a log of another log squared n in the number of hyperages. In fact, uh, the recent results construct uh, spectral specifiers which are stronger than cut specifiers. Other questions? Right. So, in that sense, if you're willing to tolerate a constant factor loss, then hypergraph cut functions are concisely representable. Uh, right. So, let, let's go back to the, the question. Uh, does every symmetric submodular function admit an alpha approximate concisely representable function? The function families of interest are hypergraph cut functions. Function G is a hypergraph cut function. If there exists a weighted hypergraph with vertex set V whose cut function is G. Uh, and the structural question of interest to us is, is, is whether every symmetric submodular function is constant approximated by a hypergraph cut function. Uh, right, so note that I'm asking constant approximation, which would be a nice improvement over root n. Root n was the previous best possible using different families of functions. Here we are asking whether we can get a constant approximation using hypergraph type function. Uh, and again, we are not the first ones to pose this question. We, we only studied this question. Uh, this was posed by Devanul Dugmi of Schwartz Sharman Singh. They already looked at this question. Uh, rather, they posed this question. Uh, and before I get into this question, there are two digressions that I want to address before going into this one. Uh, the first digression is uh, this natural sub-question. Why go for hypergraph cut functions? Can, can we hope to do this using graph cut functions? Does every symmetric submodular function uh, admit a constant approximate graph cut function. Right. Uh, even if you're not interested in concise representations and so on, you, you can forget about it. We're going to focus on this, this particular question and so on. Right, so let me address this, this sub-question. Is uh, every symmetric submodular function constant approximated by a graph cut function? Uh, this was studied by Devanod Dugmi, Schwartz, Sharman Singh. They showed that every symmetric submodular function is uh, order n approximated by a graph cut function. This is due to the existence of uh, Gomery root trees. Symmetric submodular functions admit Gomery root trees. Uh, so you construct this tree, which is in fact a graph, and that will in fact be an n approximation. Note that n is worse than root n. So the natural question is can you improve? on this n using graph cut functions. And they showed that, uh, no, this is not possible. There does not exist a graph cut function that does better than n over 4 for even this particular symmetric submodular function. This is the cut function of the hypergraph which has only one hyperedge that consists of all vertices. And I want to sketch a quick argument for this. This, this is not very difficult. Uh, so if you're interested in this hypergraph, which has only one hyperedge, which is simply the entire ground set. This is, I have only one hyperedge, which consists of this. Uh, So what is the cut function? And here I'm assuming all the, the hyperedge weight is one. 
So what's the cut function value of uh, subset? This is simply it's, it's zero if uh, S is empty or V, and it's one and otherwise. Now, suppose there exists. It's a mail register uh, on the other level. Yeah. Okay, say, say there exists a graph G on the same vertex set. I will use F for the edges of the graph uh, with, with weights uh, on these edges, some non negative weights, such that this cut function of the graph approximates the cut function of the typograph. So the H of S or the H of A is at least um, the G W of A and it's at most alpha times the G W of A for every subset. Suppose such a graph exists. Then the first observation is that look, look at any um, vertex E, G, W of a single vertex. This is at least uh, E, H of the same single vertex divided by alpha because of this inequality. And this is in fact one over alpha. For every single vertex cut, you need at least this much weight. There's some graph which is quite approximate this. You're saying for every single turn, you should have at least one over alpha of each one. Now, this tells us that uh, so this means that the total weight of the edges in this graph is, uh, well, this is half of the total weight of the all the vertices, E, W, O, U, total degree of all vertices. So this is going to be at least. Um, N over alpha. So the total weight of the edges in this uh, graph is at least N over alpha. Now, if you recall your algorithm, the max cut result, you, there always exists a cut in a graph which recovers at least half the total weight. So we'll recall this result saying there exists a subset which is non empty and proper subset such that. The weight of the subset is at least half the total weight of edges in the graph. And this is this says there's at least uh, n over 2 alpha. But you want this uh, this to be at most. N over 4 alpha. It is the two here. Sorry, why does this this should tell me that alpha is at least um, ten over four? Because I look at this particular cut. Yeah. So look at this particular cut. This should be at most whatever is the cut value in the hypergraph. This is at least n over 4 alpha, and this is in fact 1. That tells me alpha is at least n over 4. I can't do better than n over 4. Right, so they, they already observed this. So the, the constructive is due to Gomori Hu trees, which is a little more uh, uh, concept heavy. I don't want to introduce that. Uh, so that, that gives order n approximation and you can't do better than order n because even the simple hypergraph cut function cannot be better than n approximated using graph cut function. Right. Uh, so note that this bad example, this tight example, not a bad example, this tight example is in fact coming from hypergraph cut functions. So the, the, that's why they asked whether symmetric submodular functions can be constant approximated by hypergraph cut functions. Because you, you're going into a slightly richer class of functions, uh, and those are the 
bottlenecks for graph cut function. So maybe that class is the is the one to look at. Right. So that that's that's the motivation for their question. Uh, let me also address the the another digressive question here, the algorithmic question. Uh, for every given symmetric submodular function f, can we construct a hypergraph whose cut function at constant approximates f using polynomial number of function evaluation queries? The answer to this is in fact no. This, the answer to this comes from a result of uh, Switkin and Fleischer. They studied, they did not study this question, they studied the uh, symmetric submodular sparsest cut. And they showed that uh, using polynomial number of function evaluation queries, one cannot approximate sparsest cut for symmetric submodular functions to a better than root n over log n factor. And that result implies that uh, the answer to the, uh, this algorithmic question is also no, because if there exists an algorithm that uses polynomial number of function evaluation queries to construct a weighted hypergraph, whose cut function root n over log n approximates the symmetric submodular function, then you would construct this hypergraph, solve sparsest cut on this hypergraph. We're not interested in runtime here. We're only interested in the number of function evaluation queries. You would make that many queries, solve sparsest cut on this hypergraph, and then that will end up being a root n over log n approximation for sparsest cut on the symmetric submodular function, but they showed that it's impossible. So the answer to the algorithmic question is in fact no, but that doesn't mean that the answer to the structural question is no. Here we, we have this heavy constraint that we are only allowed to use polynomial number of function evaluation queries, uh, whereas the structural question has no such constraint. So any questions so far? Does uh, which one have a lower factor? Is, is this possible or not? So this this is the main. This is where we started. Uh, so th let me get into the results. I'll tell you what we can and what we cannot do. In fact, uh, yeah. So before doing that, let me also talk a bit about interesting families of symmetric submodular functions. What are the symmetric submodular functions that we are familiar with? And to the best of my knowledge, the only natural symmetric submodular function that we know is hypergraph cut function or graph cut function. I, I'm not familiar with any other families of symmetric submodular functions. This is pretty much the only family that we typically talk about uh, that comes up in combinatorial optimization. There's no other natural symmetric submodular function that comes up in combinatorial optimization. And th that Further fuels this, this this question. Maybe that's why we believe that the answer to this question should be yes. Uh, okay, this is only this is the only natural family, but uh, you can construct other symmetric submodular functions by what is known as a symmetrizing operation. Uh, so you, you can take an arbitrary set function and define this new function called the f sim. I'll call this symmetrized set function, uh, the, the fsim value on a set A is the f of A plus f of the complement of A minus f of V minus f of empty set. Note that fsim is symmetric. By definition, f, fsim of A is fsim of complement of A, and uh, fsim of the empty set is also zero. And if f is submodular, then fsim will be non-negative submodular as well. So you can take a submodular function and symmetrize it to get a symmetric submodular function. This is how you would do it. So you can take arbitrary submodular function, symmetrize and get such a symmetric submodular function. These are, of course, not very natural. They don't occur in, in the application context that we typically see. Question. This can be done for any submodular function. It won't be monotone. Symmetric functions are not monotone. In fact, one nice family of monotone submodular functions is matroid rank functions. You can take matroid rank functions, symmetrize, you will get uh, symmetric submodular functions. 
uh, let me define Metroid rank functions. Uh, a function R is Metroid rank is a Metroid rank function if it is integer valued submodular and for every subset A and element U, the function value on A union U is a is at least the function value on A and at most one larger than the function value on A. Uh, if you're familiar with matroids, then uh, these are exactly the rank function of matroids. Uh, but th th these are equivalent ways of defining rank function of matroids. Yeah, I don't want to introduce matroids, but uh, yeah, you, you can take matroid rank functions, symmetrize, and you, you would get symmetric submodular functions. But again, we don't see these in 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 the context that we, that we see that we encounter symmetric submodular functions. Right. So the only natural family is hypergraph cut functions, but uh, there do exist other symmetric submodular functions. You can construct them this way. Right. Uh, let, let's go into the results. Uh, the first result, so there's not in fact a result, there's, there's a proposition. Uh, it says that if every symmetrized rank function, matroid rank function, is alpha approximated by a hypergraph cut function, then every symmetric submodular function is alpha approximated by a hypergraph cut function. So the, the, the way to look at this result is saying that if you want to approximate symmetric submodular functions, then just try to approximate matroid rank functions. Don't worry about arbitrary symmetric submodular functions, just symmetrized matroid rank functions, focus on these and try to approximate them using hypergraph cut form. Right, so th this is a proposition. This is uh, not very difficult. I I'll show you the proof. We observed this proposition fairly early and we were trying to approximate uh, symmetrized matroid rank functions for a long time. Uh, until we realized that, uh, so we were trying to get constant approximations for uh, symmetrized matroid rank functions using hypergraph cut functions, uh, but we realized that this is not possible. In fact, uh, there exist matroid rank functions whose symmetrizations are not alpha approximated by any hypergraph cut function for alpha that is less than n to the one third over log squared n. For any alpha less than n to the one third over log squared n, there is no uh, alpha approximation by a hypergraph cut function. For example, so th this in particular says that symmetric submodular functions cannot be uh, n to the one sixth approximated by any hypergraph cut function. Uh, and let, let me also emphasize that this, this, is, uh, this is an existential result. We could not construct such a nitroid rank function explicitly. Such functions exist, but uh, we don't know how to construct them explicitly. Right. Uh, so th this is a fairly strong negative result. Uh, we also have some positive results. Uh, positive results, again, they came up before we managed to prove this negative result. Uh, the positive results, uh, we focus on some specific families of symmetric submodular functions. Uh, and these functions arise in, uh, in, in context, in the, in the submodular representation context before. Uh, we will say that a function f is concave linear if there exist non-negative weights for the ground set elements and an increasing concave function h such that the function value on S for any subset S is H of the sum of the weights of the elements in S. This is a fairly complicated definition, uh, but turns out these functions arise in some modular representation context before. Uh, Gomans, Harvey, Iwata, and Mirokni showed that every matroid rank function can be root and approximated by the square root of a linear function. This is the h of a linear function. So square root of a linear function, which is in fact uh, concave linear. So every matroid rank function can be root and approximated by a concave linear function. And the balkan harvey vata result that I showed before, here if the matrix M is in fact a diagonal matrix, then this is again a concave linear function. 
So we were focusing on uh, symmetrized concave linear functions. Uh, we were able to show that every symmetrized concave linear function is constant approximated by a hypergraph cut function. And in particular, this, uh, this immediately implies that uh, symmetrized rank function of uniform matroid is constant approximated by hypergraph cut function. Uh, but we, we were able to work out the, this research independently to get a better constant. We were able to show that uh, symmetrized rank function of uniform matroids and partition matroids are constant approximated by hypergraph cut function. Right. Th those are the positive results. Uh, any questions on the results? Yes. Exactly. So, yeah. If there are no other questions, I, I will show you the proof of the first result. Yeah. I think it's a nice, useful result to know. Right, so it suffices to approximate symmetrized matroid rank functions. Why is this true? Uh, let's look at an arbitrary symmetric submodular function. Now let's define lambda to be the max function value. And we define this new function g as uh, for every subset s, g of s is f of s plus the size of s times lambda. Now, so recall that this function f itself is uh, integer valued, so g is also integer valued. I'm assuming f is integer valued because we're interested in rational valued symmetric submodular functions, so you can scale and assume that they're in fact integer valued. Uh, so g is integer valued. Uh, it's monotone because of the choice of lambda. Lambda, you can take it to be the max function value or you can take it to be some very large value. Uh, so g will become monotone. And uh, it is submodular because f is submodular and uh, cardinality of s, this function is modular. Positive combinations of modular and submodular functions are submodular. The function g is integer valued monotone submodular. Uh, and moreover, the, the f of s is in fact half times the symmetrized g of s. So th this is just substituting what g sim of s is. The definition of these sum of s. Okay, now uh, here is the classic result on submodular representation. This is due to Helgerson in 74. He showed that for every integer valued monotone submodular function g, there exists a matroid rank function over a larger ground set. Here, this is b. Here, we have a matroid rank function on a possibly larger ground set along with a partition of this larger ground set into parts that correspond to each of the original element. This is a partition of the larger ground set into parts corresponding to the original element, such that the G function value of a subset S is the rank of the union of the parts uh, that correspond to the elements in S. Right. So this immediately, so look at, so our function G is integer valued monotone submodular, so look at such a matroid rank function. Uh, now it's not hard to see using this observation and this result that F of S is half times the symmetrized rank function of the union of the parts that correspond to elements in S. Now we know that the, the hypothesis says that symmetrized matroid rank function is alpha approximated by hypergraph cut function which means this R sim is in fact alpha, alpha approximated by a, a hypergraph cut function, but that will be over this larger ground set U. But we want to approximate uh, this function F, which is over a smaller ground set. What are we going to do? Any ideas? So you have to use this partition. So for every element of the original ground set B, there is a corresponding part Look at this alpha approximating weighted hypergraph. You have this larger ground set of vertices. Now you contract each of these UV into a single vertex V. So each part corresponds to a vertex, so you contract all of these. Then, and look at the resulting hypergraph, it will be over this original ground set. And it's not, so this bit of calculation, you can show that the cut function of the resulting hypergraph will be an alpha approximation for F itself using this crystal. I 
right? So th this is an easy proposition. Once if you know Helgeson's result, then this is a simple observation. And we, we, we knew about this observation, and that's why we were trying to look at symmetrized matroid rank functions and approximate them using hypergraph cut functions. Right. Let, let me sketch a proof of the, of the second result, this, this negative result that there is no uh, constant approximation for matroid rank functions using hypergraph cut functions. Uh, Let's look at a matroid rank function, an arbitrary matroid rank function. Our first result, this is a lemma that follows due to the existence of uh, hypergraph cut sparsifiers. If there exists a weighted hypergraph whose cut function beta approximates the symmetrized rank function of this matroid, then there exists a weighted hypergraph with order n log n hyperedges whose cut function 2 beta approximates the symmetrized matroid rank function. This is an immediate consequence of the existence of hypergraph cut sparsifiers, nothing interesting. Right, so th this, is, uh, this is good, but note that we are, we are allowing weights on the hyperedges, and these weights can be arbitrary. So the next result says that you can also bound these weights. If there exists a weighted hypergraph with n log n hyperedges whose cut function beta approximates uh, the symmetrized matroid rank function for some beta that is better than n, then there exists a weighted hypergraph with n log n hyperedges and with all hyperedge weights being rationals with both numerator and denominator being at most n q. And this, the, the cut function of such a weighted hypergraph uh, will 2 beta approximate the symmetrized matroid rank function. And th th this lemma is also not very difficult. Uh, if you're willing to lose two factors, then you can round the numerator and denominator to, to something which is not very large. Right, so we want to approximate, we want to construct a hypergraph cut function that alpha approximates the symmetrized rank function of, of a matroid, but we are only going to look at those hypergraphs which have n log n hyperedges and all hyperedge weights are rational values whose numerators and denominators are at most n q. We are only allowed to use such hypergraphs. How many such hypergraphs exist? This is, recall the, the first proof that we saw. Uh, we count the number of possible representations, and then we argue that there are more than this many interesting functions. So it's the same spirit. So how many such hypergraphs exist? Well, you have uh, n log n hyperedges. Each of them can take numerator and denominator at most n q. You have uh, this many possibilities for weights. And the number of ways to choose n log n hyperedges from 2 to the n is this much. When we do the simplification, this turns out to be 2 raised to order n squared log n. So this is the fam size of the family that we can use. Uh, now, by result of Balkan and Harvey, so this is not the exact result that they proved, but using their result, we were able to conclude this result, saying that there exists a family of symmetrized matroid rank functions such that the size of the family is much larger than this. So you, you have a lot of symmetrized matroid rank functions such that this size is larger than that, which means two of these functions should be represented by the same hypergraph from that family. But turns out that for every pair of functions in this family, there exists a subset where the function value differs by at least this function. So if you have two of these functions represented by the same hypergraph, then such a hypergraph uh, can at best of get this much approximate, can't be better. That's the proof for this result. Right, so this is from hypergraph cut sparsifiers. This, this, this is an observation rather than a lemma. Uh, this requires some bit of work, but it's not very difficult to see. And this is uh, taking Bark and Harvey's construction. They showed a large family of major rank functions with certain properties and uh, deriving this from their, from their research. Right, so th those are the main results I wanted to show. Uh, I, I won't go into the positive results. The, the, these constructions turned out to be fairly tedious uh, with a lot of 
binomial expressions or calculations. Uh, and in fact, uh, so partition matroids generalize uniform matroids, and then beyond this, there is the laminar matroids, which generalize partition matroids. We couldn't even prove this result for laminar matroids. It turned out to be very tedious calculations, and we, we couldn't do anything. Uh, yeah, so let, let me uh, highlight some open questions. I'll, I'll highlight the main open question. Uh, recall this Balkan Harvey Vata result, which shows that for every symmetric submodular function, uh, there exists uh, another function g such that f is root n approximated by g and g is of this form. And our result shows that there exist symmetric submodular functions that are not n to the one third or n to the one sixth approximated by a hypergraph cut function. Uh, but we don't even know answer the answer to this question. It's every symmetric submodular function root n approximated by a hypergraph cut function. You already get uh, root n using such functions. Maybe you can get root n even using hypergraph cut functions. We don't even know the answer to this. And uh, I, I feel that the, the one way to achieve this is by using this first proposition. Focus on uh, symmetrized matroid rank functions. Try to root and approximate them using hypergraph cut functions. And uh, part of the reason why we were doing this is, is to get that result. But we, we couldn't even get there. Showing this would already be interesting. All right, I, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Right. I, I'm also around this week uh, until Friday. I'll be in room 201. So if anybody wants to chat, feel free to drop by. Question? Did you work on the ordinary properties? Yeah, I just want to show whether the function value is greater than or less than for two. Oh, you, you, you want a partial order, basically. Want all, you want to recover the partial order of the subset. I'm not the expert on this, but uh, it's a nice question. I, I don't know if there has been work done on this. Nice question. Yeah. Yeah, question. Is there any relation between the number of queries and the size of the presentation? So if your so your question is. Um, so the algorithm question, if we allow more, is there a trade-off between the number of function evaluation queries and the size of the representation? No, nobody has studied it from that perspective. As, as far as I know the literature, no. Uh, oh, really? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's move to lunch downstairs. Oh, there are some. So oh, that's a transcript. Yeah. 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 Yeah.